live up to what was promised or what was realized. Now they've gone back to the drawing board. They are this dominant team with great individual skill. They are a completely different beast in this final evolution that hopefully is good enough to get Korea back to the finals. Oh, I love it. And you give me chills when you talk about it like that, Frost Grimm. But uh, speaking of going back to the drawing board, we had some technical difficulties with Champ Select, so you're uh, getting a little bit of a flash from the past here. Uh, if you are an old school, if you're just joining this year, this is what Champ Select used to look like, and hopefully we'll have it fixed up and running for next game. But for now, join uh, this old school flavor here in the Champ Select as Dilution does make it through. This champion has essentially been permabanned throughout the entirety of the tournament. I think Fnatic maybe got one Evelyn Lucian game before this was on the permaban list for every single team, but getting that does mean giving up the twisted fate to the side of Showman. Yeah, but it also means that Dom One knew what was going to happen. If you leave the Lucian open, especially for Cassie, you know he's going to grab it. So you immediately show what Showmaker and Dom One are trying to do, which is say, I'm not about this lane phase. Like, Lucian, you can have the lane. I'm piecing out of here. That said, this is still a flex pick, although as that Renekton gets hovered and locked in, it now loses one of the flex opportunities because G2 can play Lucian in three different roles. And you can see the value that G2 are putting on on having on a strong top side. You've already got Renekton, you've got Lilia, you've got Lucian. Technically, I guess you could see the Lucian as a flex bot lane, but I will not believe it until we see it. This will be Showmaker's fourth game on the Twisted Fate. Both he and Caps really love the pick. Whereas for the side of Caps, we've seen one Lucian performance from him so far at Worlds, ready to see what else he can do, what else he can bring to the table for this one. So now the Hecarim is going to be locked in. This is the champion that, when it comes to farming jungler priority, Hecarim was essentially non-existent. Might have expected normally to see something like Canyon's Graves come out here, but instead, uh, a real big pivot. Yeah, and it's the horse versus the deer. We've seen this matchup all throughout plans and uh, group stage. Now, I do expect that Dawn will put higher priority on taking away the Ezreal. I'm actually really curious of why they banned the Ash. So not that Ash isn't a good matchup into Jin, although both of them can kind of answer each other. Jin can match some of the push that Ash can bring into the lane phase, but Jin does have to stand still to open up his ultimate. That means that Ash has a really prime target to nail with. But usually when you have a Hecarim, Ash is fine to let go through because she doesn't have a lot of protection in the back line. Whereas Ezreal, a champion that can obviously arcane shift away, uh, should rise up for priority for perks. But it should be very obvious what perks is going to pick if the Ezreal is left open. But even then, knowing what perks is going to pick gives you a lot of power over this draft. And while you can obviously theory craft for the mid to late game, you can theory craft for the skirmishes and the team fight, we know so much of this meta right now is about fighting for early lane priority. And that is something that Ash gives you, as well as the Pantheon. Pantheon seems to be unstoppable in the support position. If you have him, pretty much no matter who he's paired with, you will be able to push that lane in early game because people cannot fight you. This champion is insane. So good to see it taken off the board and taken away. But now the question is, what are the options going to be? They can blind pick a top laner, or rather pick a counter pick for Nagari, and it looks like they will opt to do so. Saving final pick here for Barrel. I love seeing last pick save for support. Yeah, but he could have also grabbed the Thresh right now and given a lot of safety and security towards the Jin to play very aggressive in the lane. Uh, Barrel and Ghost love to play forward. I'm sure we'll talk about it more when we do get into the lane phase, but taking the Gangplank into Renekton isn't necessarily a counter pick, but more so that survival pick. Sure. The idea is that you can outscale, if you will, I'm using quotation marks, outscale the usefulness of a Renekton into the late game because of how much uh, this Gangplank can provide you. And we talked about the flex pick, and there it is. It is going to be the bottom Lucian, which makes sense. We said that you would need some sort of dash or disengage from a Hecarim. They don't go for the Ezreal. Instead, they go Lucian Recon. And then there's the Silas pick that Caps loves to use into Twisted Fate and Galio, especially because he can just grab the ultimate, then use it to match you on your pressure on the side of the map. And this kind of flexibility is something that we've known to come from G2 historically, but hasn't shown up nearly as much in this particular world tournament. So it's good to see some of that come back. The question is for me, how do Dan one game, they want to respond to this curveball, and they do grab themselves a Leona. Yeah, so they have a very powerful 2v2 in the Leona, which is a direct counter pick to the Rakan. Obviously, Rakan, if he dashes back to his opponent, you can really follow him back with the E, which then hand delivers you to the enemy AD carry. Still need to be careful, though, because the power of Lucian in his raw bot or mid or top lane is still incredibly powerful. So my eyes will be on this bot lane and see who is actually going to get the forward percentage there, who is actually going to be the lane bully, because that does uh, dramatically impact these two jungles. Junglers. Lilia and Hecarim are hard farm junglers. Hecarim, of course, going for a very expensive build in the Trinity Force, whereas Lilia gets her Runic's Echoes and then kind of falls into a bit of a power trough while she's trying to hard farm for the Slea Andries. And now we will have a bit of a delay as we head into this first game. Coaches will still shake hands. No water for them to fall into this time around. A little bit of a bummer. Was kind of hoping for a lava pit, but I guess lava's tacky these days. Oh, the floor is lava. It never <laughs> runs out of style. <laughs>
<laughs> Regardless, as we're getting ready, we'll we'll take a look at Thick Band shortly. And and Frost Grant, kind of the expectations we set are looking at Canyon. Is Canyon set up for success? Is Canyon set up to early dominate? Well, that's the Hecarim pick. On the opposite side, Caps got one of the picks that we said. We said TF for Silas. Now, he didn't get the Silas in the way that we necessarily expected him to. It did require a little bit of creativity, a Lucian Flex pick down into the bot lane. So my question is, Hecarim. Because I feel like this is the first time that we're really seeing Danwon Gaming kind of try this style. It's a little bit of a takeaway from the normally hyper hyper dominant early game farming champion. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on this pick? I think it's a bit of a pivot away from Canyon trying to have something like a Graves or a Nidalee where he's abusing or dueling the enemy jungler. And like you're saying, it's more of a hard farm style and it's giving more emphasis and agency to Showmaker on this Twisted Fate. That said, you know, when Twisted Fate is level six, um, Hecarim and Canyon's ability then to set up either dives or to invade the jungle, especially with a lot of the push power and the global of Gangplank's ultimate, makes Dom one's composition on an open map actually really dangerous post six. So the goal of G2 will be to try to get the flash out of Twisted Fate before he gets access to level six. So he can't have a lot of priority to open up space for the Hecarim. And then it makes it so much more dangerous when he does finally get access to that destiny and Silas can then match it. It's about slowing down TF so he doesn't get to uh, act before level six and then Silas just gets to be the bigger, badder Twisted Fate. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see because I think on paper when you look at... Scaling is always a difficult term, right? Because I think when people look at it, they just go, who does more damage? Right? When in reality, there's a lot of setup. It's like, how, how viable is this champion to actually find access? But when I see this composition from Danwon Gaming, like, if G2 are not ahead, they're just going to get picked apart. The GP alt, the Jin alt, you talked about it, the TF alt, Hecarim, zooming in across the map out of nowhere. That is very terrifying to deal with. But that said, G2 also have the tools where if they start to pull ahead in one or two of these lanes... It feels so difficult for Danwon Gaming to get anything done without burning multiple teleports just to fight, or multiple globals just to fight on even footing. I do agree with you. It does feel like G2's composition is a little bit more about the mid game than necessarily Dom 1's composition, although Dom 1 still have great item break points to fight on one and two items. We talk about the Trinity Force. Uh, Jin on a single item can be very powerful. So it's not like they can't be effective there, but I do agree with you. It, the game goes later and later. I do wait more towards Dom 1's composition. Um, for G2, though, I feel it's a lot about setup. There's so much setup for Yankos if he actually does want to gank his lanes. You know, you have the CC uh, that a Renekton can provide, uh, Silas, especially if he has that TF ult to follow you around, the Rakan and the Lucian skirmish power in the bot lane. So even though it is a Lilia from Yankos, I still do expect to see him kind of visit his lanes uh, or throw out a swirling seed and kind of go fishing from time to time and it to be a very skirmish heavy game from the side of G2. Yeah, it's interesting as well. I feel like this is going to be a game where Merc Treads are going to feel very valuable early on, but it's also a little bit difficult to itemize them because you're looking at two very strong mid-game spiking AD threats in the Renekton and the Lucian. And the Lucian and Renekton especially, like, feels really bad to play into tabbies against both those champions. So I, I want to find out who and how both these teams are going to itemize, where they're going to focus early game, how they can mitigate this, because... Uh, Leona's going to feel pretty bad on the opposite side as well. There's a lot of immediate hard CC that can just be shut down there. And this is just a lot of, you know, general conversation about in lane phase and the kind of, you know, abstract scaling into 35, 40 minute 5v5s. Um, the other cool thing about kind of both these compositions is how the lane assignments will play out. You know, it's a Lucian bot lane, but he can still side lane depending on kind of if he falls behind the clock or if he's on clock for itemizations and does really well into... Gangplank. I mean, yeah. it's an old school counter for the lane phase just because of how he can use his double tap to get rid of the, the shout barrels. Out to, shout out to Hooney. Hooney. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, so. Hooney, for continuing to curse us in League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a possibility that uh, Perks is on side lane duty and Wonder is more so grouped up with the team, you know, depending on if he goes for the Bork or if he goes for more of a team fight uh, oriented itemization for his Renekton. So there's a lot of flexibility for kind of all of these compositions to see where they land and kind of what the game state is and how they want to respond. And that's the danger and uh, strength of both these teams. They're both very flexible, very intelligent. Their fundamentals are clean, they're precise. Um, the creativity of G2, I think, is kind of their edge, whereas Dom one, we heard it on the desk over and over. I'm sure you guys are going to get tired of it. Their discipline, their precision. We always knew that they were incredibly gifted individual players. People saw them coming out of a uh, Korean challenge and were like, these are the guys to watch. And then they kind of fumbled. But now they've gone back. They've been forged into this beautiful diamond. They talk about it in their interviews all the time. They are a team. They are a machine now. And yeah. it's that, that teamwork and that new element that makes them so dangerous. They are so well practiced. And when we say that, 
as we're still waiting a little bit longer to get in the game here. I think the important thing to remember as well is that, like, you know, this has been coming up recently, is that this is also a relatively untested Dom one. It feels like a level up. It feels like a clear upgrade. The teamwork is there. It's no longer just the mechanically gifted kids fighting every single skirmish. Showmaker described the style as, well, one person would start a fight and we'd all run in, you know, like lemmings, one one after another and it's just a bar die. Fight. Like we're a buddy? bar fight. Like yeah, you like we we're backing up the boys, right? You know, that's how Dan one liked to play. And now it's a little bit more refined. Refined. If the boy, if he said something stupid, if he's picking a fight he shouldn't have done, they'll leave him to die. They'll play for the map. They're going to be a little bit smarter about Can how to pick Can you describe Snuggery? He's like, no, not today. Not Wait. Not today. You back <laughs> off. We'll get him another time. His time you know? will come. And that's a, that's an important thing to track because, again, this is a team that has played pretty much exclusively series against DRX, a team that, while they did struggle against the spring, obviously have been consistently getting the better of here in the summer season. They only played one best of five in their playoffs because they were coming in as the first seed there. And so for them, and also to a certain degree for, for G2, this feels like the first big best of five that we'll have seen from either of these teams in a long time where they're forced to play at their peak consistently. You heard it from Yankos. In the Gen G series, they had an advantage in mid. They were kind of winning out in picks and Bands, even with some drafts that they felt like were kind of sloppy. So I think for both of these teams, this is the first time where they have to bring everything that they have to bear 100% or it will cost them dearly. I think it's, you know, on G2 side and for G2 fans, it's that idea of you decided to take the year relatively easy because Absolutely. of the burnout that happened in Paris. G2 was very vocal about, you know, we're going to relax our players, give them more of a break. And then when push comes to shove, when it's time to turn it on, they turned it on. But that's with the caveat that they actually got knocked out both times in spring and summer and then had to go through the loser's bracket yeah. to win the final, falling to Mad Lions and then falling to Fnatic before coming back and 3-0ing the final. Now, there is no loser's bracket here. This is it, G2. If you want to make good on your promise that you, you could have a bit of vacation time, you could have that work-life balance. It could, you can mess around with what players are going to play what roles. You know, Cavs could try ADC <laughs> for a split. You got to make good on that. You got to show us that that experimentation wasn't wasn't for nothing, wasn't just to throw away what could have been valuable practice time. Yeah, this is the time to step on the gas. And for Dom Juan... This is the highest that they've ever been. You know, last time around, it was the quarterfinals that G2 knocked them out of. They uh, fell to DRX earlier in the year and then came back and now look like this dominant force. But this is the highest that they've ever climbed before. This is the most intense, the biggest spotlight that a relatively, not untested roster, but still rising star roster, if you will, uh, has ever climbed. And so now it's, can you get over the final hurdle? We heard it from the players. They're talking about the revenge versus G2, taking the LCK back to an another final after three years, is Dom Juan finally ready to deliver on what was promised to us, this incredible powerhouse next generation of LCK talent. And I like what you highlight there, the next generation, because that really is what it feels like for the LCK. For so long, it was just the SKT era, and then it felt like uh, all of the LCK kind of scrambling in recent years, and Dom Juan feels like they're the ones to bear the perfect team to bear the torch in this case. Of course, as we are further delayed, we're currently experiencing reports of connectivity issues on stage. As league officials investigate, we will keep you updated. We don't want to be hearing any reports of uh, lagging on land, so we got to, you know, nip that one in the bud before we get started. But I got some fun facts for you, Dragos. Okay. Okay. Did you know <laughs> that the only time that an LCK team has lost a final, when they've been in the final? That the Korea has lost a final when they've been in a final. Because LCK teams have beaten LCK teams. Yes, of course. Is the first time, 2012? Season 2? Season 2. Azubu Frost versus Taipei Assassin? That's the only time. If an LCK team has made it to a world final, they've always won, except for the very first time they participated. Dang. Thank you, do you think that? Yeah, yeah, do you think that Cloud Templar right now, I don't know if he's on the broadcast, I assume he's on the broadcast because he's, you know, kind of the goat when it comes to casting. Like Messed up our Templar. stat. Do you think Cloud Templar, like, hangs his head in shame? Do you think that they mock him with that stat? They're like, you know, Cloud Temple are like, are we going to have ourselves, a, you know, an SKT on our hands? Are we going to have ourselves, you know, like a Samsung on our hands when these guys get to finals? Are we going to have ourselves an Azubu Frost, Cloud Templar? You want another Azubu Frost, buddy? Sad mummy. <laughs> <laughs> That's, cra That's actually crazy. Uh, right now, though, as league officials continue to investigate, we're going to send it back to the State Farm Analyst Desk with Shox, Yamato, and Vetti. 
We're sorry, of course, to everyone at home. We want to get into game one as much as you do, but we're going to try and make this as bearable as possible by uh, having the analysts talk about the super interesting picks and bans. Yamato, what is the single most surprising thing in this pick and ban phase from your side? I think the thing that stands out to, to everyone the most is just the Lucian flex into the bottom side to line up for the Silas, because the whole idea here is to just, uh, you know, bait the Lucian, get the Twisted Fate, no Silas in the picture, you're happy. But here, Silas comes swinging with five massive monster ultimates. And that's just exactly where Caps wants to be. So there are quite a few things. I, I'm You're so excited. Yeah, I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> so let's like take our time and let's start with the bands. Because yep. I want to give a huge amount of credit to Yamato for what we talked about. Initially, when we were doing the lane by lane breakdown, Yamato said very specifically, Wonder vs. Noggery, in a meta where it's like Orn, Shen, Tank's top lane, he thought that Wonder had the advantage. And in the draft, we get in and immediately Orn, Shen, and <laughs> Molly Bear are all banned off the board. So clearly they're trying to eliminate some of the picks that Wonder clearly has a huge impact on. And they're trying to mitigate the champion pool. And then of course, while they do get the Lucian open, the priority on Jin and Twisted Fate, to me spells that Dao and game one are trying to pick away a lot of the comfort that G2 have relied upon so far at Worlds. I have a small question to that uh, with the flex, right? We talked so much about the bot lane and the fact that uh, Ghost has been incredibly good, especially in the early game and just very solid overall. Do you think G2 is giving up pressure by putting that Lucian in the bot lane, something we We've not typically seen in the last couple of months and not as much in the meta or not i'm trying to think back when we saw this matchup um, you know a very long time ago and lucian into Jin was something that was playable from both sides i think the key thing is that uh, lucian has the rakan i think leona Jin should be stronger due to gp ult twisted fate ult so i think this is just a scenario where i think g2 is going to sack the bottom sides and then just heavily play mid into uh, top because you have that GP into Renekton matchup. It's, some, it's a place where GP can actually get dove. And I think this is going to be the mission of a G2 in this game. Okay, I also from think, the first minute. I also think that Lucian yeah. could be quite an effective weak side player as well. Because once you hit level six, you have that wave clear from the ultimate to try and mitigate any like wave stacking the, to threaten a dive. You also have the mobility of the dash and you then have a Rakan and Lucian who are both quite mobile champions that can just avoid a lot of high pressure towards the bot side. He's also running the cleanse, which is going to make it even harder to lock him down. So I very much agree with Yamato. I don't think the purpose of putting Lucian bot is to like win hard the 2v2. Mm -hmm. I actually think the goal is Lucian can play fine in a one versus two because he's Lucian. This opens up Rakan to start roaming. We can then use Mickey to do what we always do. Play through mid, get mid ahead, get mid roaming Slipped around up, the map. You said we there. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, like, in they. the context of... No, 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 I'm, like, talking from the perspective I'm of... Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're making this one. It's not. No. <laughs> the keyboard warrior. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Uh, so I think that the goal is that if your G2, G2 then wants to use Mickey, open him up on the map, and then get him to play through uh, caps to then open him up and then stop roaming elsewhere. We've got hopefully uh, one minute to get back into the game uh, on kind of the Silas being able to steal the ultimates from the other side. Um, that's all good and well, but if you're down one, you have all the ultimates to use at the same time. Um. So how much does the fact that he can choose to steal whatever he wants at any moment weigh up against the fact that you have so many good ultimates and good um, engage tools on the side of down one? It's just so nuts, like Hecarim, GP ult, they have so crazy AP scalings. We saw the Leona from last week where Leona just poof, and just exploded the whole enemy team. I think, uh, you know, it's it's like a buffet of, of beautiful things. He can even TP with the Twisted Fate ultimate. He can fire from uh, afar with the Jin ultimate. Probably not the Jin ultimate, don't take that one. You have too many premium ults. Don't he just wants to do the same thing that Juan Fang did, and he wants to just get a moment <laughs> to go behind the enemy team. And, uh, yeah. So what I will say is that I think that down ones still have a very strong team fight comp that can mitigate a lot of the side lane pressure because they have a GP ult. When we look back at G2 series versus Gen.G, what they did very well was play through side lanes in the mid game by utilizing a lot of globals and just creating a lot of chaos on the map. And I think the champions like GP and TF can actually heavily mitigate that. I have that. to cut you off because the game is ready. So let's get back over to our casters. Thank you very much, Shox. We are now about to get into game here. Damwon Gaming versus G2. If you're just joining us, there was a delay for technical reasons. Hopefully, you've gotten all the analysis from the draft you could ever hope for. Love to hear it. Love to hear Yamada's breakdown of the of the bot lane match. But I think it's fair as well. Leona Jin seems to be very strong, seems to be quite oppressive. But nothing will ever feel as oppressive as that stolen Leona ult by Silas. Turns out uh, champions who shouldn't build AP but can build AP, having their ult stolen away is is quite brutal.
to play against. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway uh, is the fact that Silas does have so many high priority ults um, to use, not just in his own 1v1 matchup, to have kind of first punch, first impact on the map with the first destiny. Uh, but like the analyst just was talking about, the Gangplank ultimate, the Hecarim ultimate, the Leon ultimate, all of these are exceptionally high value for a player like Caps. And again, if there's going to be a difference maker for G2, it's Caps. On the other side for Dom1, that genius of being able to disrupt side lanes, the mobility of the Hecarim, the long range of the Gangplank ultimate, the destiny uh, available for Showmaker, and trying to uh, smother G2 at their own game when they do try to split up this map and play their hit and run style of League of Legends. Yeah, and at the end of the day, I mean, we just look at some of the numbers coming out from Canyon. Absolutely, statistically, one of the strongest players in the world and most definitely the strongest jungler right now. So have to see what his version of Hecarim does look like. For now, we are getting a pretty decent leash coming in from the bottom lane of G2. They're going to sacrifice a little bit of lane prior, a little bit of ability to hit the creeps there in exchange for that leash. Meanwhile, Canyon still clearing pretty confidently onto his second camp. Should be just a tiny bit behind Yanko's so here on overall clear speed. Yeah, and the idea should be, uh, as you were talking about and as Yamato talked about on the analyst desk, you know, that Rakan and Lucian probably aren't going to win this 2v2. Obviously, it will come down into execution, but Barrel and Ghost have been so oppressive throughout this tournament. We talked about how powerful statistically Canyon is. Uh, Barrel and Ghost have an absurd forward percentage. They kick people's teeth in in the bot lane, and that bleeds over into what Canyon can do. You know, when Dom Juan have item advantages, when they have ultimate advantages, summoner spell advantages, like knock, knock, Canyon's coming into your jungle, and he's bringing these strong priority laners like Ghost and Barrel with him. Yeah, and it's important to note. I mean, forward percentage to have stats that are that high above the average above 30%, we're talking 12 to 15% for both these guys, means that they are consistently pressuring out winning in Prio, whether it's through picks or trades, it does not matter. But that said, on the top lane, Wonderful right now is doing what he can in this matchup, but Nagari is kind of beating the hell out of him. Yeah, uh, that was a huge misstep from Wonder there to lose so much health to the tower. It's now Squirrel pulled scene. Yankos to appear up into the top side. Maybe he tries to force flash, but uh, Nagari holds it very smartly. Uh, does allow Wonder to kind of catch back up in some of the EXP difference. But now what will Canyon do with the information that Yankos is top side? He could try to go in and contest the Krug camp. He's got priority from Showmaker in mid lane, as well as priority from Ghost and Barrel. And he's either going there for deep vision, or at least we'll have bottom crab. And it's interesting when we look at it, kind of expected Yankos to pull ahead a little bit here in terms of early jungle farming, but for now, Canyon with a one camp advantage and is already working on the Scuttle Crab. Just having to go top lane to kind of bail Wonder out to kind of reset that lane and help sustain the pressure that Renekton's trying to put down. Costs him a little bit here, now behind a camp. We'll have to see what the fight looks like over this Raptor camp. Yankos can try to take it away, but he does not have a mid laner on the map right now, so it's a bit risky to go for it. TP will be used in the mid lane. Showmaker now backing off. One quick gold card, but there's the setup CC. There's the follow up, the flash away from Showmaker. The Watch out, EP tries to dance on it, but it's not enough. First blood for Yankos. And this was so crucial for G2 to make sure that they could get the early flash. You already saw that Caps was struggling a little bit with the push priority that Showmaker was able to put out, constantly getting him under the tower. Now that TF doesn't have the flash, he's going to lose a lot of that push control, and Caps will really be able to pressure him and should slow down Showmaker's influence on the map by just having a lane of priority that Canyon can play around. Canyon trying to figure out what to do, but the wards have spotted it out very cleanly. They know exactly where Canyon is on the map right now. TP being used back to top lane from Nagari. See what he wants to go for here. But right now, this is kind of the dream scenario for Caps. The repeat gank setup, very easy. Showmaker's going to have to play so far back. It's going to give him so much access here in this lane. Meanwhile, on the bottom lane, Mickey feeling pretty confident, but honestly, fantastic use of the Zenith Blade. Mickey getting caught out, getting cut down. The Ignite ticking. Barrel finds it, and that's the damn wall bottom lane we wanted to see punishing the Rakan pick. And just so beautifully done by Barrel. That's exactly how this counter matchup works. It's why Leona and the uh, last pick of Leona was so important to see Mickey's Rakan to come out and just to punish it exactly like that using the zenith blade following the recon recon and following it up with so much damage and that is definitely not easy to do very easy normally for recon to slip out of there a little bit when i've talked to mickey historically about this matchup when we saw it a lot paired with Azaya last year he said that even though leon is favored recon feels like he always gets to dictate the pace of the lane especially post six so to find this opening so early on before level six are even coming in to build this kind of lane advantage is massive for Damwon. yeah but is that just because mickey's never played against a good leona oh I mean, it's a fair question. We talked about it, right? These are definitely the biggest challenges that both of these teams have faced all year long. Just a subtle shade to all the Leonas in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I think blatant shade but they might deserve it. We'll find out. <laughs> Mickey level three in the mid lane. Obviously, we've talked about it already. Showmaker without a flash means the setup here is easy, but Barrel already in the area. 
Has to be careful. Nagari in trouble on the top side. Yanko's getting good sustained damage. Nagari going to be forced to flash out to safety. And Yanko, so while he's not pulling ahead in jungle farm, he has been absolutely everywhere on the map so far. That's his third gank this game. Yeah, particularly impacting that top lane, bailing out Wonder from the uh, tower shots that he took. Now hoping that Wonder can maybe get a slow push back towards into him. I think it didn't pan out exactly. They were trying to pull the minion wave, but from what I can see on the mini-map, it looks like it is actually going to shove into uh, Nagari's tower. So hopefully Nagari doesn't get the wave frozen away from him and find himself in a bad uh, case without Flash. Barrel here in the mid lane again, trying to put a little bit of pressure back onto Caps. Level 6 coming in for Showmaker. Caps has his ult as well, so he could try to follow if the Destiny Gate combo is going to come through. It's just a Cloud Dragon, so while uh, Dom Wan are pushing down here and securing Vision as well as Crab, <laughs> as Caps is just sprinting at them. Caps is running in, but he does miss the stun, and that's pretty big because Yankos is quite squishy, and Barrel is on the backside. They need to kill Showmaker, and they need to make it out. That's going to be one kill, and they're now trying to make it to safety. Yankos already gone down. Caps needs to retreat. Perks and Mickey on the way in, but Ghost is here. One shot, two. Still two left in the chamber, and he's hunting for a bit more blood. Barrel on the way in. Zenith Blade. How long of the cooldown? Heal to run forward. That's going to be the Shield of Daybreak. Bit of a miss, but Mickey going to whiff as well. Holding that one out. A little bit sloppy so far mechanically, but it looks like Mickey should be able to pull back to safety. Waiting on that battle day. It's holding onto it for now. Doesn't look like he has the cooldown, and will get dropped in the end. Damwa Gaming. Getting the better of G2 in that skirmish, and Barrel just cannot miss. Yeah, and it was G2 who bit off into the skirmish. Uh, Dom1 thought that they had the priority in the necessary lanes, mid in particular. They're like, okay, we've got priority, the Scuttle Crab should be ours. And then G2 sacked the fact that they didn't have priority, decided to contest it anyway, and got pretty hard punished, in my opinion. Uh, the fact that Hecarim is getting snowballed so far ahead. The fact that Jen is now sitting on two kills, like this can come back to really bite G2. And the only silver lining that they have for this early game in particular is that it's just Cloud Dragon. And when we looked at the early game of this game, we talked a lot about the importance of Canyon and the importance of Caps. Yankos has been the one to surprise. He's been the one ganking everywhere on the map. But on the opposite side for Damwon Gaming, Canyon's been playing well, don't get me wrong, but it has been Barrel. Watch this Leona coming into this fight as it plays out. Barrel has been everywhere, just one step ahead of Mickey. And this one continues to go through. The Leona is just so key. Yep, the flash forward as well as the Gangplank ultimate was really massive. The analyst just talked about it. You know, when uh, G2 are going to try to take these skirmishes, it's going to be uh, Nagari that can have that cross-map impact, especially when Wonder is using teleport back uh, towards the lane. So G2, in my opinion, not really respecting the cross-map ultimates and power that Dom1 could have, as well as the roam from Barrel. Yeah. See if they can sustain that pressure. Barrel consistently out of the bot lane right now. Similar story for Mickey as he checks in on mid, seeing if he can find an opportunity there. Of course, level seven in for Wonder on the top side, level eight for Nagri. CS relatively even overall. Gangplank always going to have a little bit of a gold advantage, but Wonder working towards that Blade of the Rune King. It looks like he's pretty committed to a potential 1-3-1 one, one here. Wants to be able to duel out a lot of the more bruiser-like champions on the opposite side. As far as game state right now, again, because it is a Cloud Dragon, it doesn't seem like anyone's too keen to really uh, overreach for it. Both these junglers would rather prioritize just farming their camps, resetting their timers, rather than taking the time to take a Cloud Dragon, unless it's absolutely free or can set them up for a strong team fight. Again, uh, Canyon's probably actually sitting on a pretty hefty amount of gold right now. He's going to complete his Trinity Force before he completes the jungle item, as is usually tradition Standard, with the yeah. Hecarim. Uh, still a very expensive build path, but once he's there, uh, and even once he has Sheen, you know, it makes him so incredibly dangerous in the 2v2 mid jungle. Yeah, because when you look at Hecarim, obviously a lot of his power is in sustained damage, but that's mostly for the jungle clear early on. Just between the devastating charge and the ultimate, he does so much burst in these small skirmishes. Can't get punished for burning those cooldowns too aggressively, but very hard to do from the position that G2 are in right now. Barrel hiding in the brush, but it has been warded, so they're not really going to get advantage there. And finally, the Cloud Drake will get taken. 9 minutes 38 seconds of the game before Danwon Gaming decide to start that one, but they will kick it off. And that's again because there is nothing up and available for uh, Canyon to farm here as Barrel finds Mickey again, but just some light trading back and forth. I say light. <laughs> light, but Barrel's now going to be in trouble here. Perks can step forward. Are they willing to commit any more summoner spells? I mean, they just saw that the dragon was going down, so they know that Canyon is on the bottom side of the map, so there's no way that Perks would burn his flash or E forward aggressively in that case when a Hecarim could come flying into your lane. Well, yeah, certainly would have been. <laughs> I didn't even see the Hecarim at the time of talking about that, so I'm glad you pointed it out for Oscar. It very much could have been just instant death there as the ultimate is available for Canyon. He will back and he will buy another piece of the Trinity Force, but hasn't quite completed it yet. So with Yankos having the fully completed jungle item here, uh, should be able to out clear at least for a little while until the Trinity Force is completed for Hecarim. Now the resets are coming in from G2 and 
They could go for the Herald. In fact, you see so much vision control set up uh, throughout the top side of the river, as well as Canyon pathing top side to try to contest Wonder here. If they kill Wonder, it should give uh, Dom one control over the Herald, as now you can see Jen's also walking towards the mid lane. Twisted Fate can come up as well. This is going to be a big deal. Wonder trying to flash out stage, but the ult's still coming in. Showmaker's going to get there, but he's not even needed. Clean kill pickup for Nagari and Canyon. And it's just too easy there. Very well executed. It's now another cut. catch. Cap's going to be in trouble here, but he's trying to turn it back. Can walk away. Obviously, the healing on Cap Cap's his W is quite strong, but they're going to burn a lot of ultimates just to completely zone G2 away from this Herald. Make sure that they can take it down uncontested on the side of Don Juan Gaming. They've already got the Cloud Drake. They're already up in kills. Now they're going to grab the Herald as well, essentially guaranteeing almost another thousand gold to go into their pockets if they can use it before plates fall. So right now, Don Juan Gaming absolutely outplaying G2 across the map. Yeah, just smashing them in the early game, and it kind of snowballed away from them when G2, again, tried to contest that crab and gave over a lot of critical kills. And then the uh, gank or repeated ganks on Wonder up into the top side. You can see what Wonder was thinking. He's like, I've got so much vision on my bot side river. I've got uh, so many of my members underneath me, but didn't account for A, the destiny, but then also the lane gank power of a Hecarim just flying in from the back of the lane. And now Canyon's at that point where when he does back, most likely we're going to see the Trinity Force completed, and that's... Now we're in the scary portion of the game. Of course, Hecarim without really any defensive utility to back him up does mean that he's always going to be a little bit squishy until about three items that in theory G2 could just try to burst him out when he does go in, but it's going to be very hard to do so because right now Don Juan are in control of the map. Don Juan can play whatever pace that they want to. They have the globals to back up any plays that they want to make as well. As we now see, Cap's taking a global away of his own. He's going to dash forward. He's fishing for Ghost and Barrel, but he has to be careful. Team now trying to back up, but that's Mickey looking for the engage. Backing off, though. Barrel is now going to retreat to safety. He's going to be one sleepy lead. But here comes Showmaker, and Caps has been caught out. Damwon Gaming punishing G2, punishing Caps for these over-aggressive plays, and Showmaker will grab another one. And the idea from G2 is that they were going to play cross-map. They figured that Canyon was on the top side, that he's got the Herald. It's probably either going to go top or mid, because your plates are more valuable in the hands of something like a Gangplank. Maybe you push down mid because you want to open it up, but I don't think that tower is as valuable. So G2 decided to handshake on it and try to make a play bot side. But Damwon read them like a book. They reset the Hecarim. He was actually racing bot lane, and like you said, this is G2 now in two different instances of this game, really pushing, trying to throw their muscle and their weight into Dom1, and Dom1 just slapping it down with a comp that isn't necessarily super powerful in the lane and the early game. And when we look back to the Gen G series for G2, it was so much about Caps being freed up to do pretty much whatever he wanted. In this game, it feels like everyone but Showmaker being freed up to come mid to back Showmaker up. And now that Showmaker is feeling good, that he's feeling confident, him going everywhere on the map to make these big plays. So that's going to be mid lane tier one going down. For a composition with this many globals, that is massive. Three and a half thousand gold certainly does not hurt either. Because now we're starting to see the GP be a little bit more comfortable on the top side of map ahead of the Renekton in terms of raw itemization. And Right now, Down One Gaming in total control. I think it was more about opportunity that they saw that the wave was in a good spot um, after the initial skirmish had come through for them to find the reset and to come mid lane. So we take another look at this one. You know, it's the fact that Caps dives so deep here. A uh, good CC by Barrel to delay it, then flashes out, doesn't trade one for one. And then it's just the chase. Showmaker comes over. I believe he's got the ghost at this point, lands the gold card. And then there's no minions left for Caps to walk through the tower to his doom. And this game is, is going to be difficult. Of course, Lucian not as strong on first item with the build that he is opting to go for. So maybe once that Muramon is fully stacked, we can see Perks finally dish out a ton of damage on that champion. But for now, Ghost feeling pretty good with that Storm Razor to just continue showing up, providing a little bit of utility and some backup damage in these exchanges. The early game, though, four turret plates to seven. Feels like at this stage of the game, Canyon, he's made it through the awkward state of the early game on Hecarim. Yankos didn't just absolutely CS gap him or absolutely outmap pressure him, although it did look like it might go that way early on. And now I feel like the Hecarim is fully online, and when he ticks over to level 11, I am very nervous for the side of G2. Uh, Canyon's a big boy right now. <laughs> he got a couple of nice uh, gift rack packages, uh, as well as some good counterplay on the map right now, and it's whatever he wants to attack. The Mountain Dragon has spawned, which means that our soul will either be an ocean or infernal. That's going to be really nice news for Dom1, who are currently in control of A, the bottom side of the map, because they have the mid lane tower uh, pushed down and will always have first movement. 
but also the fact that that Hecarim, like you said, already has his Trinity Force, as well as the GP. And right on time, the item breakpoints have come in for Dom1. They are exceptionally powerful right now, and they're going to start uh, muscling into space and just taking whatever they can, and they're just going to bait G2, you know? If you want to come and get it, come and get it. But if you fight us, we've got the numbers advantage. We've got the gold advantage. And sadly, I feel like G2's been taking the bait all game. Frostgrown. I feel like Damwon Gaming have just been consistently one step ahead. Before they were testing G2 to see if they'd go for these plays, kind of baiting them in, and now they just have the muscle to punish anywhere where G2 try to force. Is Canyon just going to focus on clearing out division here, denying any control on the bottom side of the map? This is rough for Perks. He is the one suffering here. Yankos as well. He's not going to have access to that bottom side jungle, and Perks is going to have to get right back under that tower as quick as he can. And dives are now so easy for Dom1 to execute on. Anytime a Showmaker goes missing, or even if you don't bring Showmaker because of how strong Canyon is on this Hecarim, you know, Perks, you saw him take the back. He's going to sack so many waves into the tower, but he has to respect it. He has to respect the fact that Dom1 have vision control. They have zone control. Uh, he can't be underneath that tower. There's too many dive tools. Absolutely cannot. Good news for G2 is they're, they're getting close to some of these second item completions for perks on the bottom side of the map. On the top side, you've got the Blade of the Rune King completed for Wonder. He'll be a little bit more comfortable in his individual 1v1 matchup. Deadman's Plate on the way for Yankos. Obviously, everyone loves Leandries, but I think stopping off to get a little bit of tankiness is a good recognition of the game state, where Hecarim probably can just one-shot you, and this item will definitely make a big difference when it comes to that. I also think it's almost like the uh, symbol of Yankos as a jungler for his team. You know, the fact that uh, a guy like Kanavi would go more the traditional Leandri's route. People have been discussing, you know, the merits of going for the Leandri's versus the Dead Man's Plate um, and how pivotal having more tank oriented stats as well as the movement speed stats synergize with Lilia's kit as well as make her more durable to kind of go in and out and be more of a utility champion. Um, but the fact that Yankos is kind of the, not utility jungler, but more of the, uh, the laner's jungler, whereas Canyon is, is yeah. his laners come for him. <laughs> And that's something that uh, Perks talked about when Yankos first joined this lineup, you know, is that there's this misconception that with the historic label of the First Blood King that all Yankos wanted to do is play for himself and play for these big kind of individual moments, but actually very selfless jungler. And part of the reason probably why it took G2 so long to adapt to this meta. That said, not a bad performance from Yankos by any means, but G2 getting over aggressive and getting so consistently punished has now put them in this state where Danwon Gaming pretty much get to do whatever they want, at least until uh, G2 can kind of find an avenue back into this or can complete some of those uh, second items. Well, what Dom1 are doing right now is again, because that mid lane tower is down, it's going to give them first access to rotate into either side of the river. Uh, Canyon ha already had a nice reset right on time for the second Herald spawn, and it should be a very easy pickup. And now, again, the handshake from G2. They realize that Dom1 are on top side of the map, taking the Herald. They now get indication that they were absolutely correct, and they're trying to set up a dive. But uh, Nagari playing very safe, very clever, you know, very far back from his tower, wave clearing as safely as he can, knowing that the only avenue of attack that G2 had was to somehow pressure him and denying so much of their time. So. Well, that thought is we have an engage coming in on the bottom side of the map. Yankos has been locked up. He's going to try to run for the hills. There are going to be two sleepy members there, but still the flash forward shield of Daybreak right before the shield completes. Ghost going to walk in, one, two shots. Ghost now on a killing spree, and again, G2 caught out. Danwon Gaming merciless in their map control. Danwon got everything there. They got the Rift Herald. They had the top tower. They found a pick. Uh, Nagari was able to pick up the wave as well as dissuade any sort of dive action. Like, it seems so small, and it was only a kill that happened in kind of the last two-minute exchange. But look at how much the gold lead has grown. That was that was a moment that if there was a nail in the coffin, like, G2 will probably get another chance at another team fight, but it's starting to get very suffocating here for Dom1. They are just working G2 around this map. We can see here on the little slow-motion replay, just caught out. Mickey does what he can to save this one, but it's just easy. You're on the wrong side of the map. There's so much range to support this. Ghost can follow up with the snare, can run down to find the angle for Yankos to escape at. Showmaker ready to go in as well, if Yankos even does escape, not forced to use the ultimate in that case. But that's the thing. G2's composition gets ahead. It's pretty hard. A lot of these globals maybe have to be used defensively. But the second down one is ahead, G2 never get to fight on their terms. That's probably why we saw them trying to force a gank out on the GP, force that GP out where they knew that they could force a man advantage. But just a hard thing to do. And here comes the third dragon. It will be an Infernal Soul. 50, or yeah, 45 seconds until it spawns. Dom1 are going to contest the mid wave, shove that one in. So G2 have a limited amount of time where they need to decide. Are we going to sack minions as the mid wave will eventually push against us into our second tier mid tower? Or are we going to try to create pockets of uh, darkness here and try to find a pick to flip this game? Because G2 need to flip it on this Infernal. If it goes over, I think it's, it's lights out for them. Very hard. And G2, 
Probably mixed feelings. Not exactly excited about fighting when they're behind an itemization, but know that they're not going to get a lot of opportunities to fight if they do not contest these big objectives where Danwon Gaming pretty much has to respond to them. And if G2 lose here, they're going to lose massive because they're going to lose the mid tower. Uh, yeah, this is it. This is uh, the last stand for G2. The TP comes in from Caps and Wonder. They're looking for a deep flank, but Danwon have all of the item breakpoints and they found Caps. They bet it all. Caps now backing away. Wonder using the ult defensively just to dissuade any kind of engage. G2, we're going to have to start this dragon to force the fight while the ult is up. Damwon just need to be patient. Again, look at the mid lane. Look at how much damage that tower has taken. Mickey fishing for the engagement. Showmaker flashes out to safety. Barrel has locked him up. Mickey now running, but that's the Hecarim ult right back in. Caps is taking the Hecarim ult away, but they've locked him down. They've knocked him out, and here comes the curtain call. G2 going to run away. Angle not quite right on that one, but they're going to grab the dragon, and Canyon's still dashing in. He wants a little bit more. Going into the Brooks. Look at that damage. Canyon taking names left and right. Damwon Gaming sweeping G2 off the map. G2 bet it all on that play and it immediately turns against them. Yanko's going to get a cheeky shutdown back, but Nagari there with the blade and the pistol just to get the double. Curtain call is a very apt description for what just happened to G2. Even if this game continues for another 10 minutes, it would take a miracle for G2 to flip this one back to them. The items are not into their favor. The team fights are not into their favor. They just got obliterated and game one has just been ripped away from them. And one of my questions coming into this series was how good are Dom One really? They look so good. But they haven't faced up to a lot of these best teams in the tournament. They had to play DRX a bunch of times, for God's sake. Because they've proven they could beat DRX. What would they do against G2? And in this game one, Dom One look unstoppable. This is a team not to be messed with. This is a team unlike Gen G. G2 can't get away with these cheeky plays around the mid lane, and they can't get away with team fights like this. So first of all, it opens up with a nice reactive flash from Showmaker. And then I just really want to talk about the damage that uh, Nuguri excuse me, Nagri is putting out with these barrels as well as the Gangplank ultimate, and then the follow-up from Canyon. He goes in with the Hecarim ultimate, he gets a nice fear, good damage, and then he immediately turns back onto the uh, Infernal, secures that for his team. Showmaker then uses the Destiny to get back into the fight. Hold that thought, Caps we is dead again. We come back in, as Caps is dead again. And also, Barrel died in the picture, <laughs> picture, so the fight's continuing to happen. G2 not done, they say we didn't bet at all, that wasn't the all-in, this is the all-in, and wonder, Going to get knocked down. Snare going to connect as well. Watch out. Eep will work. That's the fear coming in. Yanko's running for his life. Mickey going to hit the blast cone for him, but still not enough. Canyon again on a tear. 4-1-7. and seven. This pony is rampaging across the rift. Listen, Dracos, uh, G2 are a live fast, die young type of team. You know, uh, yeah. they're not going to watch themselves passively lose the game. They have to have an active <laughs> role in losing the game. And losing the game. Uh, Dom won't have won this game. It just, you don't know it yet. I, I can see the future. It's not looking great for G2 for game one. Just a matter of steps to take, but G2, they keep throwing their body at it. Yeah, and respect to for Damwon for not, not even flinching when the Lucian Flex pick came in, handling this one very well, presumably prepared for Caps' Silas mid. And uh, G2 going to have to go back to the drawing board in the next game. Of course, we praise them for their adaptability. This is a very veteran lineup. If anyone can bring it back mentally and adapt to new strategy on the fly, we would expect that to be a team like G2. But I definitely do not think that they expected game one to go anything like this. But the thing is, is it's the way of which Dom Juan crushed G2. You know, it was G2 that were going on the offensive and you know, there was always a question, have Dom1 actually been tested? Has anyone really made them sweat? When you do have some of the tape at the World Championship of Dom1 dropping a game, it was from JDG who did skirmish them, but, you oh, know. Oh, my showmaker! Saw the wound! Oh, no, that is BM. And let me remind you, folks, for Showmaker and for Dam1 Gaming, this is personable. This, of course, is a translated quote, but he wants to crush you two into pieces as soon as possible. He said that. He wanted them to beat Genji. He said, screw LCK guaranteed in the final. Give me that rematch. He's making it personal, folks. When you sacrifice your LCK brothers for your own revenge and highlight real. That's a great story. Tale as old as time, really. Perks, though, getting a little bit aggressive on a Canyon shutdown would be big there, but again, this does feel like the end for G2. There are always the long shot comeback moments, but understand that it's not one fight that G2 wins to bring them back into the game. It is fight after fight after fight. It is mistake after mistake after mistake that would have to come through for Dom Juan to lose the game at this point. Okay, so here's what would happen for G2, and this is what they're planning to do. This is hit and run League of Legends. This is this is some Rochambeau, you know what I mean? Like they are flying out of the, the woodwork. They are trying to catch uneven fights. They want to be sneaky, they want to be fast. They do not want this to be fair. So this is a fair fight. Don't want to putting them in the grave. No, you're kicking sand in their eyes and you're praying that they miss their skill shots. You're there's, biting. There's not, not a lot of hope otherwise. 
We can see here, Nagari gonna run for it with the barrel. Dude, to casual 700 damage, 636 technically. He's level 16 to Wonders level 13. Yes. Okay, that is not an alligator, that is a gecko to Gangplank right now. Oh my god. It's, it's brutal. That said, we take a look back. Draft is always going to be the first thing that people talk about because it's easy to understand and it's easy to it's easy to pin blame on. I don't want to do that too soon, but I do want to talk about what G2 did here. They got the Lucian Flex, so they get Caps in the mid lane. Caps 1-4 on the Silas right now. Seems to me damn well we're ready for it. They blind pick Renekton. and they were confident for anything that could happen on the top side of the map. Wonder was losing out in those trades. Yankos had to bail him out a little bit on the top side of the map. He is currently 0-4. And, and so for G2, it really does feel like a complete back to the drawing board in this one because the execution on a lot of the things they prioritized or saved flex picks for did not pay off for them. I actually disagree. I think that they could run this comp back, but it was the execution. And the big difference for Maker, Maker is kind of one of the names that you didn't talk about. It's Barrel. 1-1-6 one, yeah. one, and six right now. It was constantly this Leona getting unlocked from the lane. We know we talked about the forward percentage that Ghost and Barrel have and how important that is for A, the vision game from Dawnmon, which is incredibly powerful. They snowball on vision really well, and I hope we get to talk about it kind of in a more competitive series when we can see some of it uh, come to fruition here rather than the stomp that we're looking at in game one. Um, but Mickey has not had the same influence over the map. He's now sitting 0-4 on the Rakan, and Barrel for me has been kind of the big difference maker in tandem with Showmaker of why Dom1 have gotten so far ahead. Yeah, and that's the investment of their final pick, of being able to counter the Rakan in draft, of saving that last pick for Barrel, even through the flex pick that Perks brought to the table. Dom1 Gaming coming out on top, and it's you always want to draw attention to one member, but the beauty of this series is that anyone can show up, anyone can oh change the gosh. narrative at a moment's notice, and woo, in that case, just a quick pick a card, just a quick curtain call, Dan Wan Gaming just gonna escort this minion wave in and break the tower. All that alt there is doing is saying, back up, this belongs to us, respect it. And G2 are gonna respect it. It's a giant fan of, you cannot stand here. Please, sir, I'm gonna have to <laughs> please, ask you. Please do not put your feet on the grass, G2. This is our territory, back up. Okay, but you can see that uh, Dom One's composition is still running into some issues with sieging because it is a Twisted Fate and Gen comp, and they're not using the TF to push side lanes. So as they are all grouped up, it is taking some time, and they're using their ultimates to dissuade G2 from towers. Yeah, Caps is still fishing for an angle here, has stolen the Hecarim ult away. Will be very vulnerable if he goes in. It's very important that he is not CC'd so that he can activate the W so that he can get that healing back. Uh, but if he just gets chain CC'd, if he gets chain locked down here, he will not have really any tankiness to his name. G2 know that they have a single fight left in this game, and they'd have to, like you said, win fight after fight. But Dom one strike first. Boom! Big pick coming in. Cap's now going to be locked up as well. Showmaker ult now coming in. Cap's going to ult out to safety. Canyon going a little bit too far. Wonder going to lock him up and take him down. G2 holding on for now. Not going to go quietly, but they will still get knocked down. Big, big damage coming in for the side of Don Juan Gaming. 28 minutes in. Six kills to 20. 45.8 to 57.9. Ghost going for some style points. The flash in fourth shot. Cap's going to do what he can, but he's going golden, and he's still going to be going down. Nagari going to make it out with his life, and it's all too easy. Dan Gaming resetting some expectations, reminding G2 that not all LCK teams are created equal. Dan Gaming going to strike first blood in this series.